So yesterday, when, when we were talking, you had related the about the interview process and and the fact you were going to go to to Alconbury to fly the TR one. Mm -hmm. And I thought before we get into that conversation, um, maybe you could give us a potted history of the variants of, of the U2, because TR1 is obviously not U2. Um, and of course, people can go and do their own research, so it doesn't have to be an in-depth discussion. Um, sure. And, and maybe as we go through the conversation, from a pilot's point of view, you could describe the differences as you've flown those, the different varieties or the different variants of the yeah. U2. But what, what, uh, you know, what, what is the, the potted history of the aeroplane and, and the variants? Well, when you talk about the variants of the U-2, you go back to the original aircraft, 1955, uh, Kelly Johnson, Skunk Works, you know, the aircraft built in secrecy in Southern California. And the U-2A model, the first one, the, that aircraft actually doesn't exist. I think there's a few parts that they've held on to in, uh, down in Palmdale uh, for just for history's sake. But uh, the A model, which was a – and I have, you know, if not having the information right in front of me, uh, Chris Pocock, I don't know if you know Chris, he's a U.K. – uh, probably the, the smartest guy in the entire world on on, uh, on a U2 history. So if Chris is listening to this, he'll probably he'll probably wince at a few things I say, but without the notes in front of me. Uh, and in fact, you can go to his website. Just in fact, it's uh, Dragon Lady today. I have to look. At, I have to pull the website up, uh, take a look. But if you just look up U2 Chris Pocock, you'll find a couple of his websites. He's always got great current information on the U2. But the U2A, the first one that flew with a, a J57 engine. Uh, and then they went to the C model where they put the J75 into Pratt Whitney J70, uh, Pratt Whitney J75 engine, uh, 17,000 pound thrust engine on an aircraft that lightweight was about 16, 17,000 pounds of thrust. So you're getting a one to one, uh, climb rate on that, on that aircraft. Same engine that was in the F-105, F-106 series of aircraft. Uh, we didn't have the afterburner and, uh, they flew with that aircraft, uh, for quite a while. If you look at the old videos, uh, you'll see the, 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 the smoky uh, black trail coming off of the U2. And when they go later on to the, the larger variant of the U2, what we call the U2R, you'll also see the smoky, uh, in, uh smoke coming off the engine. Uh, and you'll know that was when they flew the, uh, when they still had the Pratt Whitney, uh, the J75 on the jet before they converted. Uh, so going back, they built 55 of the small, what I call the smaller aircraft, the small wing aircraft the A, A model slash C model. They built, I think, 50 of them, and then uh, another batch of five, a total of 55 aircraft. And if you see an aircraft in a museum or on a pole somewhere, it's one of the old original uh, 55 aircraft, the small wing. Uh, in 1967, they decided to expand the aircraft. And I mentioned this, I think I alluded to it earlier in the interview. They brought, they increased the aircraft size by about 30% to give it a lot more uh, payload capability. Uh, the payload went from about I think around 1,200, 1,300 pounds of payload, up to four or 5,000 pounds of payload is what we can carry now. And in the reconnaissance world, it really is all about payload, how much you can carry up under the top of the mountain to be able to use those sensors to watch and listen to and talk to whoever you need to. Uh, so they built 12 of those original U2R models. And, the, uh, uh, and then in the 1980s, they decided to reopen the line and build an additional 37 uh, aircraft they were going to call the U-2R or the TR-1. And uh, and what's actually interesting, real quick segue, the aircraft was designed off of the F-104, the cockpit. Uh, the wingspan, 104 feet roughly, and 104 aircraft were built. So the 104 tends to come into that uh, into the equation quite often. So they built another 37 of the aircraft plus the 12, so 49 of the large wing aircraft, uh, of which we have about 30, 31 still flying. Uh, the, the others, well, every, every one of the big wing aircraft that's not here, was crashed. So when they went to it, they kept, kept the J-75, 17,000 pound thrust engine, much heavier aircraft, so you're not getting the big vertical performance like you were getting out of the, the SC model, which uh, they quit flying uh, at Beale in the training program in 87. NASA quit flying them in April of 89 when they when they broke 13 time to climb records uh, right before they retired the aircraft. I just missed flying the C model by that much, just that much. Um, and then because of the fact that we're flying such an old engine, uh, they're having to maintain the parts and the logistics and the everything and the training for people just for that engine. Uh, and you've got a lot of modern engines in the F GE engine and the F-16 and then later the GE, uh, I think it's called the F-119 engine and the B-2 bomber that was developed for it. They said, hey, it's time, it's time to move on. It's time to get a more modern engine in the aircraft, digital fuel control, et cetera, et cetera, all the bells and whistles that you have on a modern engine. And they... Worked on it through the 90s, and in the 96 time frame, we got our, 95, 96 time frame, we got our first aircraft 
with the uh, uh, the new engine, the U2. Uh, U, they designated the U2S, but it was simply changing the engine and everything associated uh, with that. So it went from a U2R to a U2S. And actually, let me back up. Uh, the 37 aircraft built in the 1980s, U2R or a TR1, the aircraft were really the exact same aircraft. It was a matter of which funding pot uh, the aircraft was purchased out of. If it was going to stay as a strategic air command aircraft, it was going to be a U2R. If it was going to go over to be part of the, the effort over in the UK to monitor the Fulda Gap and you know back during the Cold War, if it was, if it was designated for that mission, that was when it became a TR1. And uh, I'm not familiar, I don't know if you know the backstory on that, but uh, the, the lore is that the, uh, uh, when they proposed the idea to the British government, they were not particularly happy about having this U2 aircraft come over there. Uh, but TR1, ah, bring it on over. Good, good to go. So apparently there was, a, there was a lot of politics involved in changing the name to TR1 versus U2. Uh, that's the story. I, I can't, I can't uh, validate, but I've heard it from a number of different sources for the 30 years I've been involved with the program. Um, and so now we've, uh, we've gone from the, the A model, the J57, to the C model, the J75. Now the big wing aircraft, still with the J75, 17,000 pound thrust, and then in the mid-1990s, converting over to the the General Electric turbofan engine uh, with a, a Dave D tuned it to about 17,000 pounds of thrust also. It's a very, very, uh, again, very, very modern engine. Uh, you know, the old J75, you'd look at the, th you know, if you looked at the throttle sideways, you know, the engine would flame out. You had to, you had to move it very carefully. We would manually open the bleed valves before you retract the throttle, before you bring the throttle back to idle. Uh, that was a lesson learned through uh, lost aircraft or engine flame outs. But the current engine, uh, you can take the throttle, but you could be up at full, you know, 70,000 feet or higher. You can take the throttle and be in mill power and go idle mill, idle cutoff, idle mill, and the computer will go, no, I, I think we're just going to keep flying. <laughs> just keep it going here. So it's, it's a very, very modern, uh, very, very modern fuel control. Uh, the, again, as I mentioned earlier, spool time from idle uh, up to mill power, eight to, t eight to 10 seconds. So much slower, slower spool time for that, for that, uh, the big fan to get going. But uh, it's a great engine. A great engine. A less responsive engine. What did you get in exchange for that? I wouldn't say less response. I mean, yes, a slower spool time, but a much more reliable engine, a safer engine, and an engine that um, has a lot in common with all the GE engines flown throughout the U.S. Air Force fleet, or I guess you know, throughout DOD. Uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's nearly identical to the B-2 engine. They've got four, we've got one. Nearly identical, uh, talking to our GE rep out, uh, out here who's been out here for a long time and knows these engines inside and out. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the parts, the availability, you know, you're talking engine, J75 engine that was designed and built, you know, the original one's built in the 1950s. So we're the, you know, we're the only folks using it. It costs a lot of time and effort and logistics to maintain that engine. So uh, that was, it was a cost issue and a reliability issue, quite frankly. What was the, was the 75 reliable? I thought it was very reliable. I got a thousand hours in the in the J seventy five, and uh, you know you had like anything. You know you 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 work within the limitations of the of the uh, of what you've got. And if you if you if you did if you did that, the engine was fine. I never I never had a an engine issue. I've never had an engine issue in either. Well, I had one small issue with the S model, but uh, never had any kind of major issue with the J seventy five. But it was a it was a little more manual as as you were in the descent. You know, but like I said, you before you would start on down, there was actually a valve on your left side. Normally, you pull them back, and the bleed valves will open automatically. We actually would open the valves manually just to make sure, because if they didn't open, there was a malfunction. You're going to flame out. And in the old R model, there was an EPR gauge, engine pressure ratio gauge, and we would would look at it. We had a chart in the cockpit, and we would look at the chart, and it would say, okay, passing through 55,000 feet, your minimum EPR is this, and you'd reduce the power to that EPR. Do the descent, okay, through 50,000 feet, you can pull it back a little bit more. So you had a you had an EPR schedule that you had to track as you came down in the descent all the way through about probably 25, probably 25,000 feet that you could pull it to idle. But uh, yeah, you had, you had to honor that. If you pulled it back below that, you're, there's a good chance you were going to flame out. What was and, it? Uh, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I was going to, so what was actually happening there? So too much pressure inside the engine. Um, what, what was causing the flame out? Why, why was uh, uh, the, the bleed valve? I guess, I guess, I could speculate, but uh, you know, I'm not. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not a. I, I couldn't tell you the inner workings of why that was getting too low and uh, and having a flame out. I, I really couldn't. I just didn't do it. But the uh, the S model, we're at altitude, and like I said, when we're ready to come down, you know, the, the first step of the U2 descent checklist to come down, gear down. 
the, you, know, you got to put some drag in the aircraft. So before you even put the even put you even before you even pull the throttle back, you put the gear down, and then in the descent checklist, and you finally you just take the throttle and mill, and you pull it all the way to the idle stop, and the fuel control handles it all. You'll you'll pull it to idle, but you actually will see the RPM roll back. You won't see it roll back all the way to idle. It'll roll back to a you know a fairly high RPM still. And as you're in the descent, the fuel control will then order a lower RPM, and you'll see it track on track on down while you're in the descent. Mm-hmm. The other thing that uh, is noteworthy, just looking externally at the aeroplane um, in the evolution of uh, from from the early sort of AC th- onwards, is the the modular way in which the sensors are carried. So I think everything was originally carried in the nose or the, you know, just behind the cockpit, underneath, and now you yeah. have these sort of they look like fuel tanks, you know, sort of embedded yes, in do. the wing. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a that's a modular system. Is that correct? Yeah, modular, and we, uh, in fact, uh, you'll occasionally hear people call the U2 Mr. Potato Head. If you remember the old uh, toy, you know, you can stick different parts on here and, and there. So the original aircraft designed to do what? Take a wet film camera, put it in the what we call the Q-bay, the equipment bay, the area, the cavity right behind the cockpit, and uh, stuff it up in there, and then take a wet film uh, shots down below at, uh, at Russian missile sites back in the 1950s and 60s. And... You know, the re- aircraft was designed as a throwaway aircraft. Originally, they they'd actually would, had talked about only putting skids on the aircraft, not even wheels, just skids. So it never envisioned to last this long. But the fact it can carry so much payload to altitude, they finally realized with time and as technology improved, we can put a lot more on the aircraft. So uh, improved cameras, improved cameras, and finally we go to uh, digital type things. And now uh, the same concept is going back, you know, hundreds of years, the the the, the 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 military force on the high ground has a tactical advantage and a strategic advantage. So now we're taking the U-2 and we're taking all these sensors and we're putting up as high as we possibly can. So to get these array of sensors now that we have to include a, a wide variety, variety of uh, signals intelligence type thing, uh, SIGINT, if you will, antennas hanging off the aircraft, they put on, as you mentioned, those large pods that you see on the, the current version of the U-2 called super pods. And uh, pretty good capability for carrying uh, a lot of black boxes on there. Those pods do not carry any fuel. All the fuel is carried within the wings. Uh, the, the pods are unpressurized. But they have those racks inside the pod, and they can lo- load up a lot of different uh, kind of processors. And over the you know, 30, 40 years we've had those pods on the aircraft, you can break the pod apart, take it out. Something can literally roll off the shelf out of one of the you know, many contractors that are uh, creating new and better sensors. And they can they can load them up in the U two as, as a as a as a test bed and then put them onto the operational aircraft uh, later. So the, what what goes in those pods has changed quite a bit over the years. In fact, in the six years since I've been in the program, uh, a lot has changed too. And I'm not up to speed with what they're doing, but uh, it's uh, money has continued to flow in with the uh, the sensors. And a lot has taken a lot has changed in the last six years. I'm way behind on on what they're doing and the, and the, what they're doing quite well. Uh, in addition to the pods. We have uh, we have data links on the aircraft for beaming information around, uh, and uh, the nose now uh, rather than just have a, the simple nose like you'll see back from the 1960s, the Gary Power era, if you will. Now the nose we've got two different noses that can go on the aircraft. One uh, the one we flew primarily when I was at RAF Alkenbury was a synthetic aperture radar nose called an ASARS A S A R S. It's an acronym, Advanced Synthetic Aperture uh, Radar System. And we flew it there. Why? Because uh, the radar takes a pretty good picture, and it's not affected by day night. It's not affected by clouds. And as you know, Northern Europe, a lot of cloud we're looking through. And if we want to be able to see uh, enemy uh, radar sites, enemy tanks coming across, what have you, we want to be able to uh, do that 24-7. And the, and the ASARS radar is very, very good for that. And again, since I was in the UK last, what, 27 years ago, the radar has improved dramatically. Uh, the other system that goes on the nose is a, is a uh, electro optical camera, and uh, just takes a big it's a big digital telescope, if you will, or it's a big digital uh, just a big digital camera, and it goes out and uh, it, it it takes some pretty impressive um, it takes some pretty impressive shots, and it can do it in a wide uh, a wide spectrum. Uh, in the, um, well, how do I even say this? It goes into a wide spectrum. I, I won't dive any more in, in, into that at all. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of areas that I could probably get into, but I'm always going to lean towards the side. Of, I don't know really where I can go with this, so I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. But, uh, again, limited in some capability because of day-night, uh, because of cloud cover, that sort of thing, although there's been a lot of advances in that. 
And again, I don't know how how much they've done with that in the last six to six to eight years since I was, since I last flew uh, with with the electro optical nose. Um, and then finally, the um, you'll see a big uh, big few, uh, kind of a teardrop tank on top of the fuselage on a lot of the aircraft now, and that uh, that encases a worldwide data link, so we can be I could be flying over Afghanistan talking back to the ground site at uh, at Beale Air Force Base or wherever. And I can be sending all the digital imagery and the signals that I'm getting, pump it through the entire system and, and talking real time to the technicians and the folks that are on the ground that are, you know, you know, if you look like an RC-135, they carry 30, 40, whatever number of people in the back of the aircraft that are working the mission on the aircraft. We carry those people through the data link. So I'm the only person in the aircraft, but I've got a full building of people back there that are analyzing everything that's going on. So uh, kind of diverging off of the, the pods and everything on the aircraft, but uh, the airframe itself hasn't changed a whole lot. We've changed the engine, we've changed the the the, uh, the cockpit, we've put these super pods on there. But what goes in those super pods, what goes in that that uh, tank on uh, the the pod on top of the aircraft, those change on a regular basis depending on uh, how how quickly the, uh, we get new technology and new equipment. It's interesting. I think this discussion around the mission uh, and maybe worth pursuing that um, rather than sort of trying to come back to it later. I guess there's a sense that in the old sort of, you know, 1950s, 60s era of U-2 missions, the aeroplane was off, you know, sort of flying maybe in places it shouldn't have been on a, a single mission out of contact with anybody else. Um, how has the mission changed? And it sounds like now actually it's much more dynamic. Um, it's much more sort of command and control sort of oriented. What, what, yeah, what, is, it what, really does, it, is. what does it look like? Let's go. Let's go to give you the background. You know, you, you talked about back in the day going where they, you know, where they shouldn't have been. Uh, July fourth, nineteen fifty-six was the first overflight of Russia. Uh, July fourth, well, nice, uh, nice coincidence there for us, Independence Day. And of course, it carried on twenty-eight flights through the first of May, nineteen sixty, May Day, when when uh, Gary Powers was shot down on the aircraft. So you know, it's kind of like you know you. <laughs> You send your dog out the door and say, hey, see you in 11 hours. Hope you make it back. And you just let your dog go. And there's no monitoring. You're, you know, hey, I hope my dog comes back. So you sit around waiting and, you know, 11, 12, hours, hey, my dog, he's not back yet. I wonder where he is. And I, it's, it's kind of the feeling, I, kind of the way I, I, I would imagine that they felt when they launched these aircraft out of Pakistan on the way to Norway or wherever across Russia. Hey, let's, in 11 hours, I hope he shows up, on, you know, in the pattern to, to land. Uh, but what's kind of funny is uh, – uh, when I was flying in the UK in the 1993 time frame, we actually had a, we did fly a mission out of, out of the UK where, uh, we, um, we, uh, I flew it twice. We would take off and, uh, we would just hit the, uh, I, we didn't say anything. We just hit the ident and London mill would come up on frequency and it kind of acknowledged us. And we would just kind of head out and then Scottish mill would pick us up and they would, we just, we just do with a little, we wouldn't say anything. We just hit the flash on the ident on the, uh, on the transponder. And then uh, we hit coastline and whoosh, everything turned off and we just, we went away and uh, we weren't, we had an HF radio. We didn't have the data link uh, back then. Uh, very, very few of them. They were kind of, kind of new. And we would, we, we, you know, again, I, I think that mission was about an 11 hour, 1045, 11 hour mission. And uh, you, you, it, it's funny to go, to go back and think about that. The only way they get a hold of you is through HF radio, which, you know, you're sitting there the whole time listening to the HF. <laughs> And, uh, and you know for 10 hours and uh, one, one of the pilots I, I, I complained about it and he <laughs> he said you listen to the HF radio the whole time because just turn it on five minutes at the top of every hour if, if they're trying to get a hold of you you'll hear them screaming not, don't worry about it <laughs> I always got a kick out of that but uh, uh, compare that to um, April of 2008 so uh, What's that? Uh, Fifteen years later, uh, we were flying a um, uh, we were, we were, we were, we were flying a, a, a new mission, and um, we actually had took got one one of the aircraft. We were flying. It was it was the old school. It was because uh, uh, let me back up. In the two thousands, we started flying almost all of our missions with this worldwide data link. So you can't go anywhere with the U two without everybody watching what you're doing. So they know every minute of every day what you're doing, what you're looking at, which is great because. In the warfighter, uh, where the warfighter needs on the ground, when we're actually supporting troops, which again, let's back up. You two, you told people from the 1950s and 60s that we're going to be flying as a tactical platform, helping warfighters on the ground. They'd be they'd be stunned. You know, no, this is a strategic reconnaissance aircraft. We're going to take pictures, bring them back, give them to the national command authority, and let them do their thing. But 
Now here we are in Afghanistan, real-time imagery, uh, helping uh, helping troops on the ground, and uh, it, it's kind of a different ball game uh, with that with that sensor being able with that the data link being able to pump everything back. But here we are, 2008, and we're going old school. We've uh, we've got um, got cameras on the aircraft, and we have no data link, and phew, off we launch. And I, I flew I flew one of the, I was uh, I flew one of the missions, and it was a 12 hour it was a 12 hour mission. It was uh, it, it was quite a haul, and uh, I remember. Uh, we I, I basically lost HF radio contact with them, but you know, continue to press. No big deal. I, you know, been did this years ago. No big deal. We all just get the mission done and come on back. And on the way back, I got the I got the you know the HF. We got the HF kind of we got some signals back. I could hear the call sign. I and I, I made the call back. And in essence, what what happened was uh, headquarters came back and said we've lost HF. Recall them. So they call. I'm already on the way back, and they. Hey, and you know they called and they got a hold of me and, I, and they gave me the recall, the recall uh, code, and I came back with a basically, why are you recalling me? Because we've lost radio contact with you. We're talking on the radio right now, okay? <laughs> and I'm on the way back anyway. But it, it was just funny. I think the I think the leadership over you know over 15 years have become so used to knowing everywhere that their dog, where their dog was the whole time. You can't let that dog go out for 10 hours by himself because that dog won't come back. But uh, it, again, big, big change. And, and now we have, uh, we just, I don't think they do that anymore, hardly. We, we really just don't send the aircraft off without it having a data link uh, on and uh, being able to uh, track everything. And, 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 and really, it just gives it a lot more capability, having that near real-time capability to see and hear what's going on on the ground. What, what's the difference from a pilot's point of view then in, in terms of workload, uh, the the dyna- you know dynamic nature of it or or not um, you know being prepared knowing what, what's going on having situational awareness knowing who to talk to managing radios what what, what does it mean to you uh, you know the the preparation is uh, you know when you get in theater it's all new and it's just all the local procedures once you tend to get settled in uh, in country or wherever you're going to be operating it it certainly gets easy much easier very very quickly uh, for the the normal procedures. But as we found flying in Iraq and Afghanistan, when we started really employing the U-2 to help with uh, troops in contact and uh, that sort of thing, uh, the workloads are really, really would go up. We had some, uh, I, I wasn't, never happened to me, but some of the, some of the guys that deployed a, a great deal during that time frame uh, were talking about, you know, they, they'd be up in the orbit and the only people that uh, they have troops on the ground that deep in valleys in Afghanistan and the only people they could get a hold of when they're in trouble was the U-2 sitting way up high. You know, we call you know in orbit, if you will. Not, we, we're not, obviously not, but because the line of sight, they could get us. And the U-2 suddenly became a communication relay node where the pilot is now, you know, tracking through frequencies, trying to you know call in A-10 support or, or or do whatever was needed by the by the folks on the ground. And it became it got to the point where pilots would be up there doing doing the mission, and maybe had a, they had a very benign mission one day. And the pilot's got nothing else going on. He's just you know, monitoring the aircraft. He's got some. He's got some bandwidth on his brain. And some of the guys did a very, very good job of just tuning in various frequencies that we had, listening to what's going on with folks on the ground, and actively trying to find folks. Hey, do you? You know, I'm here. Let me know if you need help. I'm here. Let me know if if, if there's anything I can do for you. And in uh, many instances, they found themselves involved in a situation where they were able to help. Uh, uh, help these folks that were in uh, you know troops in contact that were that were uh, catching enemy fire. So it, it it's, again it's changed a lot as far as the sensors go. Uh, the sensors are fairly automatic. You know you pretty much get them turned on, uh, c- continue to monitor the health of the sensors, and then let the folks on the other end of the data link take care of uh, the intel they're getting and or some any any of the tweaks on the sensor. My job primarily. Uh, as the pilot is to be the you know to be the eyes and ears of what's going on real time in the cockpit and and being that person that can have some have some SA when I am over troops in contact in the in the event that does happen that's somewhat of a more much more rare scenario and obviously very rare today now that things are winding down but uh, the job really is to get the aircraft where they need the aircraft and and to make sure it doesn't end up being an international incident too with regards to then the- you know, pointing sensors. Um, I think uh, the, the original U2 had that sort of drift sight so the pilot could look through a series of prisms and, and see the ground below and have some idea as to whether or not he was 
pointing it, the sensors in the right place, the cameras in the right place. Uh, nowadays, you have an electronic cockpit. Um, how, how do you point the sensors? Um, you know, if you've got to point a missile or a gun or, or, or drop a bomb on something, typically you've got a little pipper. You, you sort of have some idea as to where it's going to go. What's, what's the equivalent in the U2 then? Well, like with anything uh, nowadays, you know, GPS technology. So we know exactly if we know exactly where we're at, and uh, with the G, with the GPS, and we know where, where we're looking, they can they, they have all the algorithms set up for the um, let's say for the for the ASARS sent the synthetic aperture radar sensor. So they can they again I, I couldn't tell you how they how they work the software the programs, but it's all it's all works it's tied into the, it's tied into the inertial navigation system and where you're at and where you're heading to. And they put what's called a, um, a mission set. Uh, they, they basically have decided what, what they want to look at in advance. And the, the, the aircraft knows I'm here. The target's there. I'll aim the sensor there. So it's, it's fairly well automated. Uh, uh, it's, an, it's an automated process. There is, a, there is the ability for them to steer from the ground, but they, they, they take care of that. Can, can, you, can you sort of retarget dynamically? So if you're up and they say, well, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And that's one of the big strengths of the aircraft, being able to do dynamic retasking and to uh, be able to get the information near real time back to the, uh, the decision makers uh, at, the, uh, at the Air Operations Center or wherever. What, what typically, if you were flying one of those missions, then would, would the duration be? You already said that your longest mission was a 12.1. That was a ferry flight. Um, so yeah. operationally, how long would you be in the cockpit for? Uh, you know, we, we used to say that a nine-hour mission, eight, eight nine-hour mission was – Kind of what we like to do. The uh, the S model with the the turbo fan engine, the GE engine, extremely efficient engine. We could if we put a full load of gas on the aircraft, we could fly it in excess of probably 15, 14, 15 hours. That's you know that's that, that's a long time, and uh, it's you know you're going to reduce your safety margins just from fatigue. So we put less gas on it. We fly it a little bit higher, and we we try to keep the mission durations and then you know no no more than uh, nine. I, I don't know what the current policy is. When I was flying it, we tried to keep them at a max of around nine to ten hours. Uh, there are times when you get out there and they'll say, you know, you'll be on station, be ready to clock out, and they'll call you up and say, "Hey, we really need you on station for another half an hour. Do you have the fuel? Do you have the ability? Is your fatigue okay?" And you know, if, if you're good to go, hey, I'm hey, keep, count me in. Thirty more minutes, we'll do that because it's if they're asking for it, there's, there's, a, there's usually a very, very good. There's always a very good reason that they want to keep you up there. Does the aircraft have a, an also pilot auto throttle? No auto throttle. It's got an autopilot. Uh, the current autopilot, a significant improvement over the autopilot we had uh, uh, in the in the early '90s. Uh, so what we have, the, the autopilot has two different modes, if you will, that we fly on. We uh, we almost always fly with it in a mock hold mode. So when you when you take the aircraft off, uh, you take off, you fly it. We put uh, if, uh, when I fly it, I put always put the, that gust, the uh, reflex, into the up position, and I climb out. The, the tech order climb out is 160 knots indicated airspeed. So full power, climb out at 160 and head on up to altitude. When you're going through about 52,000 feet, somewhere between 52 and 60, and one, uh, 52,000 feet and 60,000 feet, you'll actually uh, change your speed over from 160 knots um, to a 0 .7, 0 0.71 Mach. That actually occurs right about 53, 54,000 feet. So as you're climbing 160, 160, when you hit that time, when, when now your Mach hits 0.71, We'll then catch 0.71 and we'll climb at uh, 0.71 and we'll stay at 0 0.70, 0 0.71 the entire time. So your mission profile for that nine hours, that throttle is full forward, and uh, you're mill power the entire time. You're you're at full power until the end of the flight when you pull that throttle to idle to come back down. Uh, so the autopilot, once you get up there and you're on mock, you there's a mode you can take and it's mock hold, and the autopilot will then pitch and hold whatever mock you have set on the uh, uh, in the autopilot. The other mode you can do, and we, we actually do it a little bit more, uh, we're doing a little bit more on certain certain missions, but it's an altitude hold mode. Almost uh, prior to us doing these new missions, uh, almost a worthless mode for you. Maybe just to, for a few seconds to help you with uh, taskings when you're down in maybe 25 or 30,000 feet or in the radar pattern momentarily. But we actually have found some need for it uh, with some of the sensors and some of the way we're employing the sensors to maintain a very, very specific altitude at our operational altitude. Uh, but we don't use it. I'd probably say I don't know. Uh, when I was flying, maybe one percent of the missions were flown in the alt in the altitude hold mode. Everything else and everything we flew at Alconbury was uh, flown in mock hold and holding 0 0.7, 0 0.715. And would it follow? Will it follow steer points? Um, and is there an LNAV mode? It does. So uh, yeah, we've got uh, we can 
I think 99, 99 points we can put into our into our navigation system, and you can sequence through them. You know, one uh, yes, you can sequence through them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and and so on and so forth. Uh, you have the ability to change it. And uh, one of the things we were doing in ex- in Afghanistan, for example, is we would um, some of the missions they were putting a grid of just points across Afghanistan, and you talked about the dynamic real time tasking, so we could we could get into this get on station, and then we get a call up and say, hey, we want you to go to waypoint four then 22 and then uh, 68 and so on. And then they give us maybe six, seven points. So we program them in and do that. And maybe through the fourth waypoint, Hey, we've got something going on over in the Western part of the country. We want you to go to uh, steer point waypoint four, followed by nine, followed by 12. So we just had this grid of points and we could just check a board, just, just move around through the country based on the needs of the people that are analyzing the Intel and listening to what's coming up, coming up uh, from the ground. I was going to ask, it might be a bit of a stupid question, but um, when, when you're that high, and I'm assuming that it's still, it's still a secret how, how high you fly operationally, so I won't, I won't bother asking. Uh, you can volunteer it if it's not. Um, but when you're up that high, um, you can see an awful lot of the world. Um, do, do, you, uh, do you have the ability to look out the window and sort of um, visualize what's on your map in the sense that, oh, I know that it's over there and I can see that sort of mountain peak or I can see... Um, that river intersection there and that's where I need to head or do you just are you really just heads down letting the computer fly the airplane a little bit of both uh, I found myself uh, uh, you know relying heavily on uh, uh, on what's on the screen what's on my my waypoints um, not a whole lot of looking outside unless uh, there have been instances where you know I, I, I have had to uh, have need to look outside and, and keep track of what's going on but it's a combination of both and uh, you know, one case in point, where on um, first uh, first day of Desert Storm, 1991, I was flying a camera mission, and my my navigation system uh, went uh, went out. And uh, you know, shooting's just started and everything. I didn't want to lose the mission, and I, I literally went outside and found found an intersection of a couple of roads in Saudi Arabia that I was looking on my TPC chart and was able to get everything realigned and and uh, redialed up. So. You know, it, it, it's, it's a lot of it's a, you, there are times when you find yourself doing VFR navigation at 70,000 feet, but uh, it, it's a combination. It's a combination of things. You use whatever you need to uh, to build your essay at the time. So if, if we can go back then to um, just prior then, I guess, to you going to Desert Storm. So you going to Alcambra in the TR1. I think you said it took Ooh. you six months or so to um, t- to learn to fly the U2. Um, what what's the distribution of then of activity in in that period? Because presumably the flying bit actually, I mean, if you can go and do three rides on an interview and, and be able to land the aeroplane, the flying bit isn't that onerous because I guess either you can do it or you can't, and then it's just a case of refining it. So what are you, what are you spending your time doing in that six month period? Well, when you get back there, uh, when you go through the interview process, you know nothing about the aircraft. And as I mentioned, we we actually put them in the back. We put the interviewees in the back seat. We don't want to learn about the electrics. We don't want them to know about the hydraulics. We just want to go up there and we handle all that for them. We just want to see them fly the aircraft. So when we come back, then it's a, you know, it's a month of ground school, learning all the hydraulics, the systems, flight characteristics, yada, yada, yada. Everything you would learn through any, about any aircraft you're going to go fly. And then we, you get into the flying phase, and uh, it's changed a little bit over the years. Currently, I believe it's six, solo, uh, six dual flights you fly in the two-seater. Uh, and then your seventh ride is your first solo flight in the aircraft. Uh, and then you go start flying high in the aircraft. You, I think you fly one, uh, two, I think you fly two uh, under current syllabus, which has changed obviously quite a bit. You fly two high flights with your instructor and then your third, your third, your third flight. And pretty much from then on out is going to be uh, all solo high flights. So, uh, I think it's a total of, I think it's whittled down to 14 flights now, uh, in the, in the program. Uh, to get get your basic qualification in the aircraft, and then once you do that, you move over to the mission uh, um, uh, the, the the mission qualification program MQ phase, and that's there's a lot more ground study there, and that's when they, the the, uh, the the guys and gals will go in the vault, they'll learn about the threats, they'll learn about the sensors, they'll learn about how we employ the aircraft, not just the stick and rudder skills, which is what we're we're just trying to get people competent in handling the aircraft and getting it out and back, uh, like you would with any any aircraft you've got to get good at. And now they dive into the MQ phase, and it's a lot of study. It's a lot of, you know, what's the what's the what's the mission set like over there? What are we, what you know, what are we doing over there? What's the big picture? And uh, a lot more study than I just fly. But they'll build them scenarios, uh, realistic scenarios, and then they'll brief, you know, they'll plan the mission out, and they'll go fly the mission. 
And uh, that's uh, that's about another, I think it's another six or seven rides uh, for that. So about 20 rides uh, in the actual aircraft to go through the uh, the entire process. And when you look at the MQ phase, well, I think it's, and, and all training, it's probably close to uh, maybe eight months. Uh, somewhere in there for the folks that stayed, now that everybody stayed at Beale, uh, you're also getting checked out in the T-38. And the T-38 is, is a what, sort of a, a currency trainer type thing? Yeah, we call it the companion trainer. It's uh, we, you know, we we have fewer and fewer U2s uh, over over the years. It's not not enough aircraft uh, to keep everybody current and qualified. And using the U2 to b- do an, a basic instrument qualification is somewhat of a, a poor use of a very very limited uh, resource. And frankly, using the T38s is uh, is, is dirt cheap as comp- compared to flying the uh, the U2. So we're trying to be a lot more cost effective in flying the T38. Uh, it's, it isn't, and people go, ah, it's a twin engine, supersonic, swept wing. It has no bearing on, on flying the U-2. Well, it actually does. It's a very, very good instrument trainer because as slow as the U-2 is, it, it requires a pretty, a pretty hefty, pretty quick cross check when you're flying instruments. And even though the U-2, we have the old A models, which have this, you know, your regular uh, attitude indicator and the U-2 has got the nice glass, the skills transfer over and, and the speed at which your cross check uh, needs to move. It, it works really well. You know, I've flown both aircraft as a, you know, for most of my career. And I take my word for it when I tell you that the T-38 is an excellent, excellent companion trainer for, 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 uh, for instrument training and just for general airmanship for flying the U-2. So what's the, what's the most difficult part of that process then of the, uh, you know, of the sort of becoming mission qualified process? Ooh, most dif- difficult part. The, um, Well, I don't know. I don't know if I'm with them. What the most difficult part? I think for some folks uh, that don't have a T-38 background, they're having to learn two aircraft and get competent in the in general knowledge on two aircraft. I had an advantage because I came to the T to the to the U-2 as a 30 as a T-38 instructor pilot, so I already already knew the aircraft, the T-38 inside out. Had flown a thousand hours in when I first came to the uh, uh, came back to the U-2. Guy going to Alcamary didn't have it, but. Actually, when I came back to Beale my, uh, for my second time, I already had 2,000 hours in the T-38. So very, very easy transition for me. But imagine somebody coming to the U-2 out of the KC-135, uh, the C-17. They've never flown the T-38 even in pilot training. And now they've got to do the 38, get their basic qual on the 38, and then bam, they're right into the U-2. Finish U-2 training, then get back into the 38, get recurrent in that. And then, you know, day to day, you're you're having to stay in the books on both aircraft. So there's a little bit of a there's a bit of a challenge there, certainly not insurmountable, and uh, just just something you need to stay on top on top of. But I, I would say, at least for me, I, I considered staying um, relevant and up to speed on how we're employing the aircraft and the ever changing sensors. Uh, that 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 always takes work. And you, know, you talk to any anybody coming out of bombers, fighters, what have you. I think that's always the challenge is the things that happen in the vault and, and being able to stay tactically uh, relevant to, in the aircraft. You know, flying the aircraft's a lot of fun uh, and the sticker rider stuff, but really, you know, the, the, it's the mission that gets things done and, and the pilots work really, really hard at that. So it's, it's not just through the qualification side, but just, I think just through your entire time as a deployable U2 pilot, staying relevant on the defensive systems, the threats, how the sensors work. Oh, we have a new software change. How is that going to affect me as a pilot? And just being able to stay up with the continually changing world that we live in with uh, uh, high technology sensors. Do you have, um, I'm, I'm thinking now rather than previously when you had a, a detachment at Beale and I'm um, sorry, a detachment at uh, Alconbury and, and then uh, obviously you were, you were based at Beale, but do, do you have individuals who are uh, sort of subject matter experts in different parts of the world uh, as a pilot flying you U2, are you expected to be able to go and fly I won't say against because that that's not really what you do, but but go and fly close to, let's say, you know, threat systems of one nation or another nation, or um, you know, are you how how does that you how does that work? Uh, well, we do, and we do have a tactics uh, side at the at the 99th Reconnaissance Squadron. So they've got they've got folks that work in the tactics side, and that uh, both intel uh, officers, intel enlisted, and the pilots that work in there, and they're you know that's that's their that's their meat and potatoes, if you will. But you know the subject matter experts to where we fly, the detachments that we have generally have uh, they have full time they have a full time commander, full time uh, ops officer, and in some of the cases now it's changed a lot in the last few years. We actually have a usually one pilot that's a, a line pilot there full time. So when you deploy over there, you'll get there, and you know the DO and the commander that have been there for 
six, seven, 12 months, whatever it is, they're, they're, they're pretty up to speed on what's going on. And you know, when you get there, they're, you're, you're going to walk in, they're going to say, here you go. Here's the binder, read this cover to cover. And then they come, come, we'll, we'll, we'll sit down and we're going to go through a lot of material. So the first, you know, the first few days you're in theater while you're getting caught up on your, you know, getting your sleep cycle caught up, you're spending a lot of time in the books and learning a lot. And then they'll sit down with you and basically talk you through the mission and what the threats are, what, you know, what's just what, whatever the specifics are to that particular location. And so I would say, at least from my uh, experience, it's the, it's the commander and the operations officer that you'll see at the detachments that are the subject matter experts. And then back home, uh, the folks that are over in the tactic shop, they do a great job of getting you spun up and ready to go. So what were your first couple of years like then at, at Alconbury? You've already mentioned the mission being to you know, provide intelligence on the folder gap, that being a sort mm-hmm. of part, part of Germany, a lowlands area where the, you know, the Russian military were going to roll through if, yeah. if, if the balloon went up. Um, what, uh, what sort of missions were you flying? Was it exclusively to, to sort of photograph the folder gap or were you, well, you, you already said you flew a longer mission. So yeah. you know, what, what other things were you up to? It was it was primarily up and down the inner German Czech border, just you know back and forth. So you know somewhat somewhat like what we do in Korea now, except instead of flying east west, or if we were flying north south up and down the inner German Czech border. Uh, but again, I got there. You know, the wall was coming down, and uh, but we still still had the mission to fly, so it was fairly low threat, and uh, um, we had a ground station in Germany that uh, that we used and. Uh, we would talk to the German, uh, the German uh, ra- uh, air, air, air defense controllers, uh, and you know, doing our thing. And they were up, they were up and running. You know, the wall was coming down, but the threats were still over there. We would still see the uh, the missile sites fire up every now and then. Light us, you know, they, they would, you know, they'd illuminate us, and it was uh, generally, you know, we we document it. But no, it was it was it was a very very low threat, very friendly situation, as you as you may remember back from the 1990 1991 time frame. So up, up and down the inner German border was, uh, was, was, our, was our meat and potatoes. As I mentioned, we did have another, uh, another long-range mission. And, uh, uh, and right before I got there, we actually had a mission that we flew. That They, they flew. It was a 12-hour mission, and they would, they would take up out of the U.K. and go down to uh, uh, the northern part of Africa. Uh, it was a pretty, uh, pretty interesting mission. I never got to fly it. They terminated that right before I got there. But it uh, sounded like a, quite a long mission, you know, six hours down and six hours back, and you get back and you're out of gas. What else did we fly while I was out there? Um, during the uh, when the Bosnian conflict came up, uh, we started flying the missions out of there. We would take off and fly down uh, south, turn the corner, come across um, northern Italy through the uh, just on the south side of the Alps, and then up and down the Adriatic. Uh, we did quite. We did. Uh, we did a lot of the missions uh, out there. And then, uh, in fact, in uh, 1992, July 92, we deployed over to Aviano Air Base in Italy. Uh, to get real close to the, uh, the, uh, the, the operations area out there. And that was when Aviano was, uh, you know, Aviano was quite the super base. And then, you know, later with uh, the F-16 wing that they have out there, you know, it turned into a quite a very busy base, especially in, ni- especially in 1999 during the, the, uh, the war uh, over there. They were flying combat missions, dropping a lot of bombs. When we got there, Alcanberry was a sleepy little base. And it was, uh, uh, there was the, uh, the reserve unit, um, reserve or guard unit from a, uh, Florida flying S-16s, they were on the way out. They'd actually just gotten hit by Hurricane Andrew, and they were packing up to go back to go see what you know, what was left of their houses. And there was a, a couple of Italian Chinook helicopters, and uh, that was really that was really about it. It was a sleepy little base. But uh, yeah, yeah, we did again. We did a lot of the uh, a lot of the missions uh, up and down the Baltic. And, and this was again, we're back with the sort of the glass, the steam gauges, the glass dials. Um, no, no sort of in in information to you as the pilot as to what it was you were the sensors were seeing so you were sort of flying the route and you wouldn't know until you got back whether or not you got the intelligence that you've been asked to uh on those missions we had just started carrying the data link uh so we did have it on on board uh and in fact the um the mission uh the deployment in july of 1992 uh that was the very first operational deployment of 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 the uh uh what they call the peg now Pylon Equipment Group (PEG). Back then, we called it Senior Spur, but uh, that was the very. First. They actually had done it a couple of deployments uh, prototype, but the uh, actual the very first operational deployment was in 1992 uh, to uh, Aviano. Uh, and the, you know the missions we flew out of Alcanberry, um, uh, they were because of the drive time down and the drive time back. They were a lot shorter, which is again why we why we deployed to Aviano because we took off and you're right there in the orbit and getting eight hours of collection 
uh, every single time. But um, I, I think we flew, uh, we flew, we flew some of the camera missions uh, out of Avion. In fact, our ops officer uh, was the um, flying U two out of out of Alkenbury was the uh, uh, if I remember it was yeah I think it was out of Alkenbury was when he uh, was the guy that found the uh, the mass graves uh, in uh, in Yugoslavia using a U two on a camera mission. Hmm. And that was when, you know, Matt, I think it was Madeline Albright, to, you know, showed that, showed those photos to the United Nations. And uh, uh, so, again, the, the, the wet film camera, people forget, you know, they, they think we've moved on to all the digital technology, but there's still some very, very good uses for the wet film camera. I, I want to ask a question, and, and I hope you, you don't uh, you don't take it the wrong way. Um, and this really relates to sort of the, the missions that you were flying back in those days, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, but you said something yesterday when we were talking about the interview process and how some guys you know, sort of don't stick around and others stick around. And, and one of the questions you said that they might ask is, how do you stay alert? How do you stay awake? How do you stay um, mm-hmm. sort of focused on these long missions? Um, and I'm, I'm thinking sort of back in those days then, where as a pilot, you didn't necessarily know, you couldn't see what your sensors were doing. You, you, I guess you turned them on and... You, you knew your times, you knew where you were, you were doing your job. Um, was it boring? Oh, there's certainly times when, it, when it's boring, but uh, I, I, I stay pretty busy in the cockpit. I'm, I'm, I, I work really hard to keep track of, uh, especially in, in the op area, of making sure the aircraft is exactly where, where it needs to be. Uh, what's my divert location? If the engine quits, what am I going to do next? And those, that information is changing you know, every 15 minutes, you know, where my divert location could potentially be. So I'll be, uh, I, I, I stay pretty busy. I'm, I'm, I'm monitoring my fuel. I, I, I do a, uh, I do a fuel ladder. I, I basically graphing the fuel down there and check to make sure that the fuel burns going down the way it should, or actually our fuel burn, you know, we may start at X number of gallons per hour in the next hour. It's a little bit less as we go lighter and higher and so on. I would get in the, uh, I would get in to the, uh, the fuel charts before I flew and see how the aircraft's fuel burn had been before all I'll uh, compare that to make sure the aircraft's burning the same amount of fuel. Nothing's going on that it, that shouldn't be happening. Uh, checking the accuracy of the navigation system. So I stay pretty busy in the aircraft, and I would say probably a lot of the folks uh, do. When we're ferrying the aircraft across the across the Atlantic or across the Pacific, just ferrying the aircraft. Not much going on. There's no sensors on the aircraft. You're just ferrying the aircraft, and moving it around, and, and frankly, it's pretty uh, pretty laid back. And it, it, you could you could find it boring, but I. Uh, I find myself just enjoying the view and having time to sit back and just enjoy flying the aircraft on the ferry flight. And, you know, the last ferry flight I did was in, um, it was in January of, uh, 20, uh, 2014. And I flew the aircraft out of Fairford back to, uh, back to the U S and it was a 12.1 hour flight. And the first, first half of the flight was, uh, it was just terrific. And I'm flying across Greenland. I'm just got my, my phone out, taking pictures of everything and just, just a magnificent view. And then the, then I literally at the halfway point, I had a, a significant pressurization issue on the aircraft, and I spent the rest of the time working the pressurization issue, talking to a civilian a ham radio operators on the ground that were relaying me back to Beal, and it was on a weekend to track the guys down to help me out with uh, some ideas on that and backing me up in the checklist. So then the, the next six hours goes by fairly quickly because you're just constantly trying to communicate with everything. Next thing you know, I was like, wow, I'm, I'm already finished through going through Canada. I'm coming through uh, – I'm entering into the United States airspace. I'll be home in an hour and a half. So, um, so you know, depending on what's going on, uh, there's not a whole lot of time to get bored. But um, I, I, again, if I find if I'm sit, if I'm sit, sitting in the YouTube looking around, going, you know, ah, nothing's going on. I probably need to, I probably need to focus on uh, on you know what's what is going on because there's a lot happening, and just to make just so the aircraft so it stays boring, you got to work pretty hard. Does that suggest that it's it's um suited to a particular sort of personality then you know sort of who's, who's fastidious um sort of a, you know where, where attention to detail is king not to not to suggest that you can't you know professional yeah. aviators have all those qualities i'm not suggesting that there are there are well i guess they won't survive very long if they don't have some of those qualities but yeah no i i, I don't i don't think any anything uh well i don't know i, I don't think there's anything greater about it than um uh, in those those professional qualities than anybody else I, I really just think it's a matter of personality, you know, what, what you enjoy. Some people, some people, I know people that have gone and considered, you know, done, done the fighter thing and said, I don't want to fly fighters. I know people that are, that have flown heavies. that did the fighter train, you know, did the fighter exchange and oh man, I, I was the best thing I ever did in my, my life goes to go fly fighters. So I think it's a personality thing. Uh, some people would love it and some people would hate it. And that's the beauty of the interview process. I think is it's one of the very few assignments that the average 
Air Force pilot, he or she can go, you know what? I want to kind of build my own destiny. I want to go try this out. Mother Air Force is a saying, hey, here's the next assignment you're going to go to. You, if you can get released, you can say, I want to go check this out and see this is, if this is something I want to try. And if, and if it works for if it works for somebody and they jump into it, great. And if it doesn't, they can see it and they, they can walk away. And it was I would tell every person that came through that I, that I interact with in the interview, I, I would tell them the, the exact same thing. I said, it's really easy to get out here and go, wow, this is different. It's a great group of people. I mean, it is a great group of, of folks. We're kind of our own little niche community. We, you know, the, the air, you know you're, it's, a, it's a really cool airplane. Nobody ever really gets to see. Very unique mission. The black T-38, you get to fly those in the side. So it's very easy to get all caught up in all this newness and wow. I said, but be very, very careful. This is not for everybody. I said, you remember, you are interviewing us and you can walk away anytime. You've got that airline ticket in your hand. You can walk away anytime. And I'll, t- and I'll tell them also, if you jump into this program and don't and you don't really do the interview process, due diligence, a year or two years from now, and you find yourself miserable, going, I really, I do not know why I came here. I should have never done it. You have nobody to blame but yourself. The Air Force did not force you to go do this. You volunteered for it. So you're going to have to suck it up. So better than rather than do that, take a good hard look at what you're doing here for the next week and a half. We're paying you TDY money. We're paying your entire funds. All we're asking you to do is to learn everything you can in the course of a, you know, eight eight work days, everything you can about the U two, and just focus on it and get and and see if this is what you want to do. And if it is, great. And if it's not, though, be honest with yourself because we don't. Nobody wants to work with somebody that's miserable, and you don't want to be miserable for the three years you're going to be in the program. So let's just figure it out now and uh, and go from there. 